And the scripture I've chosen this morning is taken from the Gospel of John in two different places, chapter 4 and also chapter 7. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. Don't forget this. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have granted, given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing to eternal life. And then in chapter 7, we continue with another teaching of Jesus at the great feast on the portico of the temple. On the last day of the festival, the great day of the feast, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God, and bless you all. You may be seated. Preparation here because I'm not going to work from up there. I'm going to work from down here. I have to be careful. This is Jones and it was off. Well, <laughs> One of the things I like to do in my old age is thousand piece puzzles. This is a thousand piece puzzle. I build the frames out of this is over 100 year old wood that my son and I tore down a barn down in a town in Virginia that's known as Tom's Brook. You know where Tom's Brook is? Man, you don't know where this barn was though. It's way back in the back hill country, and I had a four-wheel drive Jeep, and I went straight down the hill and back up another one and around by the creek in order to tear down a barn. But when I put this puzzle together, I looked down here, and lo and behold, there's a photographer's name there, and it's Jeff Milstein. So I looked him up on the internet. And I discovered that he just took a picture of this. This is an actual photograph that he took. And he is a famous photographer that goes all around the world. Check him out on the website. Uh, Jeff Milstein, M-I-L, one L, S-T-E-E-N. He's got pictures unbelievable around the world. And he took this because this too is an unbelievable story. 
I've always been intrigued with the creation and the inventions of the human mind in history. And water wheels are one of the oldest. Do you know the water wheel is probably, they believe, the first invention that harnessed something other than the legs and arms of human beings to get a job done. And they did it because they discovered that the water is moving. And this, this water wheel is 42 feet in diameter. And it's the kind that they, uh, they feed from the top. So um, being a, a good teacher that I try to be, I even got my little pointer here. So <clears throat> this water wheel is on a college campus known as Berry College in a little town that I call Rome, Georgia. I think they pronounce it Rom, Rom, Georgia. It was built in the 1800s in, in Hermitage, a little town some distance from there. And for years in the 1800s, it was used as a grist mill and a, uh, uh, a cotton, not a cotton picker, the pulling the seeds, what do you call them? The cotton, gin, cotton gin, gin mill. When it was also discovered in that little town that bauxite ore, do you know what bauxite ore is? It makes aluminum. Bauxite was discovered in the time, a little bit after this was built. And the first company to start mining that was nothing other than Alcoa. So understand, everything that is made out of aluminum, you know, think of it, so many things made out of aluminum, it all started in the same little town where this mill was. Eventually, the grist mill and the cotton deal wasn't used anymore, and it fell in disrepair. A lady professor at Berry College in Rome, Georgia, 1930, in the School of Engineering, now process that a little bit, a lady professor, School of Engineering, in 1930. Wow. Berry College is outside this little town. And a few weeks ago, Joan and I were on our way down to uh, Huntsville, Alabama to see some friends and relatives, and we stopped to see this. Because in 1930, this lady, Miss Berry, Ms. Berry, negotiated with who the people that had come in in possession of all of the mining company's land and talked him into donating this whole thing to the college. So they dismantled it in 1930, stone by stone, stick by stick, and they moved it all the way over to Barry in Rome, Georgia. I'm going to call it Rome. Because I wanted to say to everybody, we just came from Rome. We traveled to Rome. <laughs> and at Rome, they set it back up with the School of Engineering and all those students replacing, putting it all back together again. And the way it works is that up here, up in the hills somewhere, and I didn't see that, is the college pond. And the pond is up here somewhere. And they have piped the water from the pond down underground, and it comes all the way somewhere underground here. Here's the creek down here. And it goes right back up in this tower right here. Do you see that tower right there? Stone tower. And then it goes out. There's a big pipe that's probably 10 inches in diameter right up here. And when they take all the air out of this upright pipe, none of you guys ever siphoned gasoline, did you? They create a siphon, and all of the water comes with no pump, no pump. It comes right up here. This thing still works today, by the way. They put it in use every, one day a year. And it comes down this sluiceway, 
So this is an over-the-top feeding water wheel. Water wheels are so old, some of the earliest, earliest are probably 4,000 BC. That's before Abraham, folks. And then it was, you know, one of the uh, inventors of those early ones were, were more laying horizontal because they didn't know how to really put them all together standing up. And so they just let the stream go by on the side and, and turn the wheel. But then they made vertical ones. And there is either an over-the-top feed water that comes down here and pushes this wheel, or they put the wheel down in the creek, and the creek comes along and pushes the wheel going this way. The whole bottom line is there is so much power. This thing is 42 feet in diameter, so for every one of those arms right there, you got 21 feet. Now, if you got math and, and architectural people in here, you can figure out how much weight could you lift with a, with a stick of wood or a rod 21 feet. I mean, I'm a little kid that started farming when I was 12 or 13, and I even had it figured out that I could pull steel fence posts with a long rod if I had a fulcrum about six inches away from the fence post and a 10-foot rod, even a little kid 70 pounds, I could hang on that, and by golly, the post would pop right out of the ground. Who is it? Aristotle said, give me a place to stand and a rod long enough and I'll lift the world. So that's, that's the power of this water. Now, I put this up here, and I brought this along today for a couple reasons. I make these things and I try to sell them. I haven't really sold too many so far. And I make the frames, but I wanted to illustrate what Jesus is trying to teach us today. I want two things for you to think about. You're in a situation in this church that nobody knows the future of. Anybody here know what it's gonna look like 12 months from now or two years from now? Nobody. You're in, you're in a time of change. But remember that Jesus, our Savior, taught in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well. And what time did she come? Why? Nobody else would be there. And she was embarrassed. And she didn't have a bunch of friends. All the little old ladies got together in, in her town, but they didn't invite her. Why? A lady of sin, a lady of many husbands, a lady who lived with a man and wasn't married. Boy, wouldn't Jesus have a heyday today if he came back and walked up and down the streets of Inwood and, and uh, Martinsburg? Holy smokes. Uh, I think he'd have a lot to say. Well, that got me off track here. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Jesus said, if you only knew who's asking you for a drink of water at Sychar, Samaria, which, by the way, the Bible says he had to go through Samaria to get back up to Galilee. Don't you believe it for a minute? He didn't have to because everybody bypassed Samaria from Jerusalem to go to Galilee. They just went over to the Jordan River and they went up north because they didn't want to walk through the Samaritan place. They didn't want anything to do with those 10 tribes that left Judah and Benjamin down south and became Judah and intermarried with the sinners of Canaanites and all kinds of terrible people. So the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, but Jesus, our Savior, it says in the Gospel of John, he must needs go through Samaria. Because he knew there was a soul that needed him. Haven't your lives and my life be illustrations of things that God did for us way beyond our expectations? How is it that Joan and I could meet, now married almost 52 years? 
out of a period of time of my whole life, and I'm 82 years old now, folks, that was only three months long. And I'm from Minnesota, and she's from Illinois. How in the world's God going to work this out? I choose to go to seminary in Evanston. <laughs> well, he's getting closer, but it's still a long ways from the hospital where she works. But at the very last minute of three years of seminary, I choose to take a quarter of what they call CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education. And you do that in a hospital or a nursing home or a, a mental health hospital. And I applied and the supervisor uh, in her hospital out in Park Ridge, Illinois, accepted me. So I became part of his class. Still hadn't met Joni. How much of this should I go through, dear? Be careful. <laughs> well, our mutual friend was my supervisor, Reverend Art Ree. And one day he says to me, Dave, there's this little nurse up on 5 West that I think you should meet. Oh, dear Lord, I, no, 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 no. But eventually curiosity got the best of me. And I went up the elevator. I was on 4 Central, and she was on 5 West. So she was one floor up, and I was right here. Sure enough, old Dave, he had to investigate. So I went up there and said hello. Okay, I won't say any more of the story. Talk to her after, after church. Um, this wheel, this wheel shows the power of living water. And that's what Jesus said in John chapter 7. See, in chapter 4, he just talks about living water. Well, it's not dead water. It's not stagnant water. It's not, not moss-infected water. It's moving water. It's live wire. It's living water. And think of what for centuries, centuries of time, water wheels have done to bring life to people. They ground feed. They ground grain. They made flour. They turned turbines to make electricity. They, I mean, just think, there isn't anything that we use every day that didn't start way back there somewhere with a water wheel. They harness the power of the living water. And so in John chapter 7, Jesus finally says, well, what is this living water? Hmm. It isn't what we buy in a bottle of spring water now for my coffee pot. Jesus says, and John adds the comment. Jesus said, this he spoke of as the Holy Spirit. That the believer would be filled with the Holy Spirit. But when he said this on the last day of the feast in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. It was still 50 days after his resur resurrection that the day of Pentecost came. So he was referring ahead to what the Holy Spirit. So you and I, dear friends, are filled with the Holy Spirit if we believe in Jesus Christ. And we become the workers for a water wheel of faith, of love for Christ. A water wheel of doing, inviting of other people to this church. You need to look, look at all the empty pews. We need about three times as many here. We are the people who will lift the hurt of some people. We are the people who will do the work of the kingdom of God. That's why I brought this picture to you. That's why I'm so intrigued with what a water wheel does. We are the workers. Don't wait for the preacher to do it. Don't wait for anybody else to do it, a great evangelist. Jesus said, we are his witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Jericho and to the uttermost parts of the world. So that's, that's my sermon.